Ezekiel chapter 34. Last week we uh, talked about God appointed Ezekiel as the watchman that God was mentioning to Ezekiel that I point you as a watchman so disasters are coming, the, your, your enemies are coming. When you see them coming, your job and your duty and responsibility is actually tell the world, I mean, tell the people inside the, the fortress and let them know that your enemies are coming and disasters are coming so they can realize what is, you know, uh, you know coming up to their life. And uh, if, if Ezekiel does not really relay that or, or prophesize those information, if they die, God, at, God said, I'm going to actually ask dear uh, blood f uh, from your hands. So it is important that Ezekiel was, was whether he like it or not, whether he, uh, he wants it or not, God is asking him to be the, uh, the witness as well as the, uh, the message deliverer so that people can hear the God's message. And that is not only for Ezekiel, but it applies to us as well. We, as a people who actually receive the gospel of Jesus, we have to do the same thing. Not only just that we know the message and understands and we're, we are saved, we have to relay that message to the people who are closed. And we'll talk more about that one um, throughout the, our, our um, study of Ezekiel. So let's talk about chapter 34. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesies against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, oh, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourself, should not, sh uh, should not shepherd feed the sheep? For you, uh, you eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you... Uh, slaughter the fat ones but you do not feed the sheep so this is a really important message that we have to remember god is speaking to the shepherd of israel shepherd being all the leaders of israel including um, the priest prophets and the people who teach the god's words and all of those people who are in at the uh uh, the leadership roles and the officials in the, uh, the, the in, in Jerusalem. God appointed them as a shepherd to lead God's sheep. But what they do here is, as you can see here, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Though, says the Lord God, a shepherd of Israel who have been feeding yourself, which means they have been feeding themselves. They like to eat, but what they don't do is when they eat, they don't share anything. So they're so, um, they enjoy eating their own food to just to feed themselves, but they do not want to share with anyone. So if the shepherd is not taking care of the sheep, what is the reason to have a shepherd? Shepherd is there to really protect the sheep and feed the sheep. That's what that shepherd is for. But the shepherd is not doing what the shepherd is supposed to do. So they're busy feeding themselves, but you should, uh, should not shepherd feed the sheep? Shepherd's job is to feed the sheep Take care of the sheep. That's what the shepherd is for. If the shepherd it doesn't care about the sheep, but it's just the feeding himself to do nothing at all, then better not having the shepherd. You eat the fat. You clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughtered fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. What they do is they take the sheep and they take the the sheep and slaughter them and feed himself. What kind of shepherd is that? Shepherd is not to just to be there to just look at, hmm, let me see. Oh, that one's a fat. That one looks good. Let me just, just 
you know, take that sheep and let, let me cook this. That's not shepherd. Shepherd is taking care and guarding the sheeps from the, you know, the wild animals and leading them to pastures to, so that the sheeps can eat. But this shepherd is not a normal shepherd. This is bad shepherd. This shepherd is just to keep eating and slaughter the sheep but not doing anything other than that. But not only actually they're eating, but they're taking what? Wolves. So they're taking advantage of this sheep. They're not sharing anything with the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, and the injured you have not bound up, and strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, with the force and harshness you have ruled them. So this is the type of work that shepherds supposed to do, right? What do they supposed to do? Strengthen, sick the, uh, um, the heal the sick uh, sheep, and if the sheep is injured and bound up and strayed up, you know, if you, you have to actually bring them back and lost have not sought and force and harshness, you have ruled them. So you have to be soft to really take care of the sheep, but you didn't do it. What is then shepherd doing? What's the purpose of having this shepherd? No purpose for this shepherd at all. They're taking advantage of the sheep, but they're they don't do anything for the sheep, which means they don't care about the sheep. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts because they don't care and they don't really protect the, the actual the sheep. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every hills. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. So they didn't care about any of the sheep. So if this is the, what the shepherd is doing, what would you do to this shepherd? If you have a sheep that you actually let the shepherd and take care of your sheep but the shepherd is not doing the shepherd's job what would you do this is a, almost the same situations like let's say you have a baby and you're going to work and you actually hired you know someone to take care of your baby right and then you hire them to just to take care of your baby so you can go and work but the bait the the babysitter who comes and supposed to take care of your baby is not doing anything and feed himself and just not care about the baby and wherever the baby goes and it maybe fall under the stairway and they, they don't care. What would you do to this babysitter? Fire that babysitter. Yeah, not only just the fired, but you, they did not care your baby and then your baby is injured. All right, something happens to your baby. Just firing that babysitter is not good enough. What would you do if your baby is actually hurted? All right, because the babysitter did not take care of your baby. You wouldn't be happy, right? You'd be mad. Same thing. God actually had the shepherd to take care of his sheep, but the shepherd didn't do anything. So, therefore, you shepherd, so it's not one shepherd, shepherds. Hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declare the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey. Remember, what is God saying? My sheep. My sheep. It's not your sheep. My sheep. As I live, declared the Lord God, surely because my sheep has become a prey and my sheep 
have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd. There was a shepherd, but there was no, but there was no shepherd because they weren't doing it, and they weren't doing it as a shepherd. And because my shepherd have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God: Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep. At their hands and put a stop to their feedings. The sheep no longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouth, that they may not be food for them. As I mentioned, they're not only don't care about the shepherd, but they're eating their own the sheep. God is saying, "You're not eating my sheep." And I'm going to drive you out. This is something that you need to pay attention. How many times God's been saying, "My sheep, my sheep, my sheep." He's just kept saying, "It is not your sheep; it's my sheep." That I actually just have you to take care of my sheep, but you are not doing what you are supposed to be doing. But you're eating my own sheep. So, literally, as we said, remove that shepherd. I don't need you. You're not my shepherd. You're not supposed to be.、Uh, you're、uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So drive the shepherds out. For thus says the Lord God: Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is coming, is a sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek my own sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered, on a day of cl-、uh, cl- uh, clouds and thick darknesses. Okay, what does this remind you of? What does this remind you of? Does anything remind? Hmm. This should remind you of something. Can you just re- just see what this God doing? Doesn't this really remind you of Luke chapter fifteen? What's in Luke chapter fifteen? So let's go to Luke. I always reference to John chapter fifteen, but Luke fifteen is not something you're familiar, right? But you will know. What Luke chapter fifteen is. So let's read. Now the tax collector and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribe were grumbled, saying, "This man receives sinners and eats with them." So he told them this parable: What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not l- Leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, "Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost." So, I tell you. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repent than over ninety-nine righteous person who needs no repentance. So there's a shepherd, the true shepherd, taking care of ninety-nine,、uh, the, the hundred sheep. But if the one was lost, and leave the ninety-nine, and then look for that one shep, you know, the sheep that was lost. This is the true shepherd. 
what the shepherd is supposed to do. But the other shepherd God mentioned in the Ezekiel was when the sheep was lost and wandered in a mountain, you don't look for them. Therefore, wild animal comes and eat my sheep. But you don't care. So there is difference between true shepherd versus bad shepherd. So this is something that we need to pay attention. What is then true shepherd? What is true shepherd? What is the true shepherd supposed to be doing? So, let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that me, the man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hears his voice, and calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follows him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. This figure of a speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may not uh, uh, have a life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flee and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees bef uh, because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own knows me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So you can clearly say, see there's a true shepherd and there's a hired man, which is the hired man is not a true shepherd. They don't care about the sheep because the sheep are not their own. They're hired shepherd, and they're not a true shepherd. And since they don't care about themselves, they don't really, do. when the wild animal comes, instead of fight with the animals to protect the sheep, he's the first one to flee and leave all the sheep behind. So wild animal comes and eat, and all the sheep are scattered. So, two things. Whether the true shepherd or a bad shepherd or a hired shepherd, they are called as a shepherd. They are a shepherd. That's their job. And they're, they're called themselves, I'm a shepherd. 
Just because they call themselves a shepherd does not make them a shepherd. The true shepherd is the one who cares for the sheep. The other shepherd, that even though they call themselves a shepherd, but they're not shepherd because they don't care about the sheep. This is the key. We call ourselves a Christian, but do we do what the Christian is supposed to do? Or we call ourselves a Christian, but we don't do what the Christian is supposed to do. If the leader of the church, they are called themselves the leader of the church, but do they care for their sheep or they care for themselves? They can call it shepherd, but there is a too distinctive difference. True shepherd, false shepherd, but they both call themselves a shepherd. We need to be able to identify who is the true shepherd and who is not a true shepherd. The sheep that are taken care by the sheep, I mean, by the, the false shepherd, what happens to the sheep? Either eaten up by the wild animals and lost and then, you know, may get sick, right? Whereas the other sheep, they're taken care by the true shepherd. They're protected, they're cared, they're led by the true shepherd, and they actually eat the grass. So there is a difference between true shepherd as well as false shepherd. God is actually pointing this out to the shepherd, which they call themselves a shepherd, in Judah. There are many shepherds, they call themselves a shepherd, but they're not shepherd. This is the key. They can call it whatever they want to call. People say, I'm a Christian. I'm a leader. I, I, I'm a so-and-so. They can call it whatever they want. They may have a position, a role as that. But if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then they're not shepherd. And that applies to us as well. And all Christians, we're on the same boat. We can call it whatever we want to call it. But are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? God called us to be the witness of Christ Jesus. But are we the witness? Are we supposed to be doing what the witness is supposed to do? Or we call ourselves a witness, but they don't, we don't do anything as a witness. Then am I the witness? I'm not a witness. Witness supposed to testify about their experience, what they have seen, what they have saw. You have to testify. That's what the witness supposed to do. But if you don't do testify those things you have experienced, you keep it for yourself, then you're not a witness. Same thing. God is calling out to this shepherd. But then, what would God do to this shepherd? The bad and false shepherd. God will be mad. Because, once again, what does this shepherd do? The bad shepherd? They're feeding themselves with the sheep that the master had to let, you know, you know, let the shepherd supposed to take care. So God is saying, get out of my way. I will be the shepherd for my own sheep and I will take care of them. I will look for them. I will protect them. I will do it. Therefore, God cares for his own sheep. This also reminds of the confession of King David. What comes to our mind? Psalm chapter 23 that we all know. What is that? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my souls. He leads me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I will 
I walk through the valleys of shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Once again, this is the true shepherd. David being a sheep, following the shepherd. Shepherd takes care of the sheep. I'll be comforted because you are leading me. Remember, what does the shepherd do with the rod and staff? The staff and rod is not only used by the shepherd to fight or drive away the wild animals who try to attack the sheep, but also when sheep are sc- scattered, when they, when they just go you know, out of the track, what do they do? Hey, 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 come back here, come back here, come back here. Use the staff to just tap in to bring the sheep coming back to the path they're supposed to be in, right? So, shepherd used the staff and rod, maybe hitting the the sheep to lead them to the right path. So, when the shepherd hits the uh, the sheep, it is not to really just like you know um, trying to hit the the sheep for no reason, but try to lead and guide the sheep so the sheep stays on path. Come back again in Ezekiel, verse 13 again. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the uh, ravines and in all the inhabited place of the country. So, when God is giving this message, this is when God is destroying Judah and Jerusalem. Babylonians are on, on, on his way to destroy the, the Judah and Jerusalem. So, God is about to really punish Jerusalem. But what is the promise? When I hit you, the sheep will scatter, but I'm going to bring the sheep back. Because the sheep are not listening to the shepherd. So what does the shepherds do? Shepherd is disciplining this sheep. Not because the shepherd hates this sheep, but to protect them, making sure they continue to live. This is what God is doing. I am striking you, punishing you right now to discipline you so that you could live and other sheep could live. I'm striking this now. I'm hitting you now. But I'm going to bring you back. Bring them back. This is the God's heart. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their uh, grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture, they shall feed on the mountain of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. Remember, this is the double prophecy. Why why is this double prophecies? It's very simple. When God strike the, the Judah and Jerusalem, And have the Babylonian to come to destroy them and bring them to the Babylon. Later on, God uses the Cyrus to destroy the Babylonians and free the Israelites. So they come back to their own land. 
So God restored them in the history, but God is talking about the true shepherd who will come. And who is that true shepherd? That is Jesus. That is Jesus. He is our shepherd. We are his sheep. He takes care of us. So this is why God said, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. This is why we read the John chapter 10, that he calls himself, I am the true shepherd. I will seek the lost and will bring them back the uh, strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. As you, as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must uh, thread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of a clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have uh, uh, trodden with your feet and drink what you have uh, muddied with your feet? This also reminds of something. What reminds of is Matthew chapter 25. Let's take a look what Matthew chapter 25 is. Matthew chapter 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. What does God do? When He returns, He will separate the ram and goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, and I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was a naked and you clothed me. I was a sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, fe you know, and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink and welcome you, or naked and clothed you? And when did, uh, when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And one king will answer him, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, which is the goat, Depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire, prepare for, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, God is clearly 
at the end time, he will scatter the sheep from the goats. Sheep on the right side, goats on the left side. And you can clearly see the difference between the sheep on the right side versus goats on the left side. But remember, when Jesus said, I will separate them, keep this in mind. Before Jesus separated them, they were in the same place. They were together. The sheep and the goats are mixed together in one place. Which means, this is what I mentioned. We call ourselves a Christian. We call ourselves a sheep. But maybe I'm not a sheep. I may be a goat. They were together. They're just, oh, we're all sheep. No, they're not all sheep. Some are goats, some are sheep. This is the key. We can call whatever we want to call ourselves. However, that's not how God will see. He will separate it. You or me or call ourselves a sheep, but I may be a goat that will be separated and that may actually stand on the left side instead of the right side. It is important. Who separates it? Jesus will separate it. No matter what I call ourselves, no matter what I claim, I myself, oh, I'm a sheep. Doesn't matter. When Jesus comes and when he separates it, if he says, I'm a goat, I'm a goat. Regardless of what I claim. So it is important from the God's perspective. It is not my perspective. I mention this to everyone. What I think, it is not important. What's important? What God sees me is important. Because at the end time, no matter what I say, no matter what I claim, it does not matter. I gave this example as well. We, as a Christian who comes to church, we call ourselves, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christian. We worship the Lord. We praise the Lord. We pray to the Lord. Let me ask you this. What is the... How can we be sure? How can we be sure we are saved? How can you be sure? Hmm? How can we be sure? I'm a believer. I'm a true Christian. I mean, you have to accept Jesus. Everybody calls himself, I accept the Jesus Christ. Whoever enters in the church and who actually attend the worship service, don't they call themselves, I'm a believer, I believe in Jesus Christ? They all claim that. Unless they are the first comer who just came to church. Because they call themselves a Christian. The reason they call themselves a Christian is because they, they believe in Jesus Christ, right? Otherwise, they would not call themselves a Christian. They all call it a Christian. So how can we tell who's the sheep and who's the goat? How can we be sure? They all claim, I believe in Jesus Christ. Remember I mentioned this to you guys. What is the difference between conviction versus belief? What is the difference? How can we be sure that I believe in Jesus Christ? Is that a conviction or is that a belief or the faith? What is it?
Let's go to uh, Galatians for a second. Galatians chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that just a Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by work of the law or by hearing with faith? And you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracle among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as the Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as a righteousness, Know that, know then that it that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, "In you shall all the nations be blessed." So then, those who are of faith are blessed among with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the books of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteousness shall live by faith. But the law is not of a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on tree. So that in Christ Jesus, blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What does this mean? Apostle Paul is rebuking the churches of Galatians. And he's rebuking because after he left, there are Jewish people who came to the Galatian church and taught them. Hold on a sec. What you learn from Paul is all false. What you must do you have to follow a Jew's law, the Moses law. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the Moses law and then believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. Paul said, no, forget about the law. Forget about circumcision. Forget about this, this and that. All law, forget this. Just believe in Jesus Christ. You will be saved is what Paul taught them. And after Paul left, the Jews came and told the people of Galatia and said, No, 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 no. That's not how it works. And they fed the different information than what Paul preached. When you look at the chapter 3, verse 1, how does Paul start? Oh, foolish Galatians. Paul is a saying, you foolish, the people of Galatia. You don't understand. Did you receive the salvation through practicing the law? Or did you receive salvation by believing Jesus Christ? Remember, Galatians are not Jews. They're Gentiles. 
The law was given to Israelites, not to the Gentiles. Why would you force the law of Moses to the Gentiles? What is the law? Did you practice the law to become a righteous? Or you became a righteous because you believe in Jesus Christ? You foolish. This is a critically important message that we have to remember. You are not saved by practicing the law. If the practicing the law is going to save you, then you are perfect like God. The law was a given to every one of us to show that we will not be able to follow the law. We all fail to follow. You may be able to just keep some but fail on another, the law is, unless you're perfect on every law, you're not righteous. Therefore, there is no righteous because no one can keep the law perfectly. Therefore, what do we do? We realize that by law, oh my God, there's no way that I can keep this law, so that means I will never be saved. What should I do? What can I do? Oh, there's one way. Forget this law, but Jesus is my salvation. So believe in Him, you will be saved. Once again, what was my question? Going back to my question again. How do you know that you say, I believe in Jesus Christ as the conviction or faith? How do you know? Because every Christian claims themselves they believe in Jesus Christ. How can you tell and how can you separate from one to the other? It's very simple. What did Paul say at the end of verse um, 9? So then... Those who are of faith, blessing among with Abraham, the men of faith. And verse 14 says, So that in Christ Jesus, blessing of Abraham might come to a Gentiles, so that we may might receive the promise, the Spirit, through faith. What does this mean? When you truly have faith and believe, you will receive the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe, if you don't have the faith, you would not receive the Holy Spirit. Which means you can claim yourself that you believe, but if you don't receive the Holy Spirit, you have a conviction, not faith. You will receive the Holy Spirit as the gift when you believe. Once again, going back to what I said before. Conviction is I confirm my own faith. I claim I believe in Jesus Christ. Who confirms that, that I believe? I confirm or God confirms my faith? Who is the one confirming my faith? Should I confirming my own or God should confirm my faith? Who should? God should. God is the one who confirming my faith. And once it's confirmed, what do I receive? The Holy Spirit. When the faith is confirmed by God, you will receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. If you just have a conviction that you claim yourself, I believe in Jesus Christ, but if you don't receive the Holy Spirit, what does that tell you? It was your conviction. It is your conviction. It is not faith. You can call yourself a Christian, but you're not Christian. This is why the Paul says in Romans, let's go to Romans. Rome chapter 8. Rome chapter 8, verse 8 and on. Those who 
are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. This is why this message is there. If you don't have a Spirit of God, you don't belong to Him. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it a Christian, you could be a pastor, you could be a leader, you could be whatever you want to call yourself. doesn't matter. You claim, but your claim doesn't mean anything to God. It's very simple. Do you believe or you don't? If you believe, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you don't, you don't receive, period. That's what is going to tell the difference between whether you have a faith or you have a conviction. You may have a wish that you want to believe, but you still don't, re- you, you don't believe it yet. It's very simple. Coming back to Ezekiel again. Therefore, God will separate the sheep from goats. So what is the sheep? The sheep are the one who received the Holy Spirit by believing it. The goat, they can call it whatever they want to call it, but you are goat and you don't have a Holy Spirit. That's what the difference is. Once again, they were together before. Before Jesus comes and start to separate, they were there together. They're following the shepherd, but shepherd will separate it. This is the key. Verse 17 again from Ezekiel chapter 34. Once again, as for you, my flocks, though says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must uh, tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water and uh, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet and must my sheep eat with uh, eat what you have uh, trodden with your feet and drink what you have uh, muddied with your feet Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and lean sheep. Because you push with sighs and shoulders and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flocks, they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will, uh, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. So, is David still alive? He's gone. He's dead. So why God has called David all of a sudden? And what is, what is God saying? My servant David is a shepherd, one shepherd. Who is he referring to? Jesus. He's referring to Jesus. He's not referring to the the David who who is dead in the past. He's talking about my shepherd, my David, that David. What is the meaning of David? David? What is the meaning of a David? Beloved. Beloved. My beloved son. Who is it? Jesus Christ. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. So, isn't this very clear? What God said to Ezekiel. And why did God actually spoke to Ezekiel? To prophesy to the people of Judah. Tell them. 
This is my plan. This is what will come. Have they seen it? No, they have not. Once again, this is a double prophecy. First, I will bring Israel back from Babylon. That's the first prophecy which was fulfilled. Second prophecy, I will send the true shepherd, Jesus, to you. And then when he returns, he will separate the sheep from goats. So we have to see ourselves. Am I the sheep? Am I the goats? Who determines? I don't determine. Who determines? God determines. So how can we be sure that we're sheep? It's very simple. If we believe in Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit, I'll be on the right side. If I don't, I'll be on the left side. We can call it whatever we want to call it. It's your freedom to say it. But when the judgment comes, when he starts to separate it, we have nothing to say. At that time, people will say, you're not right. You're not just. It's not fair. You can call it whatever you want to call it. When you separate to the, the left, what is prepared for the left side? Lake or fire. No matter what you did in your church, no matter what you did, doesn't matter. This is why Matthew chapter 7 says, Lord, Lord, haven't we met, uh, haven't we actually heard your, your message? Hadn't we actually drive out demons by your name? What did God say? I don't know you. They claim, oh, we ate with you. We learned from you. We drove out the demons. We did this. We did that. But Jesus said, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. This is something we need to keep in mind. You have to check and verify. Am I the goat? Am I the sheep? Verse 25. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land. So that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sheep in the woods. Remember, while the beast is come, attack and eat the sheep, right? Do you want to take a look? Well, since we haven't been to a place where we normally go to, let's go to Revelation. <laughs> Where else could we go? <laughs> Revelations chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous name on its heads. What's coming out of the, the sea? The beast. The beast is coming out of the seas. Let me ask you this. What do you think this beast will do? What do you think this beast will, will do? Well, the beast is to just try to kill the sheep. Right? Move on. Chapter, the same chapter, verse 11. Then I saw another beast arising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a, a dragon. So, what is coming? Another beast to coming. So the what was the first beast? The first beast was the Antichrist. What is this second beast? False prophets. They're all beasts. 
That's what the what what does beast do? Attack sheep, eat them up, right? This is why First Peter. First Peter. Verse 8. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What does the, the Satans do? They're like a lion looking for the prey to eat up. This beast is one is going to eat up. Right? So, it's easy to be eaten up when the sheep is scattered and wandering that will be the target when the sheep is with the shepherd you're protected but if the sheep is lost and sidetracked and no shepherd is there you will be eaten up what does that mean if the sheep is stay with Jesus less likely you'll be eaten up by the beast if you sidetracked if you lost your shepherd most likely you will be attacked by the wild animal and the beast and you will be eaten up very simple so should we be stay with Jesus absolutely if you sidetracked and you follow others than shepherd you will be vulnerable and you will be eaten up by the beast. Come back to Ezekiel. Once again, verse 25 again. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild the beast from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the wood and i will make them and the place all around my hill a blessing and i will uh, send down the showers in their reason they shall be sh uh, uh, they shall be showers of blessings and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase and they shall be secure in their in their land and they shall know that i am the lord when i break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them they shall no more be a prey to the nations nor shall the beast of the land devour them they shall dwell securely and none shall make them afraid and i will provide for them renowned uh, plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations and they shall know that i am the lord their god with them and that they the house of israel are my people declare the Lord God and you are my sheep human sheep of my pasture I am your God declares the Lord God this is the message and promise God made which was a fulfilled the truly fulfilled by Jesus Christ and people who live after the crucifixion of a Jesus Christ we all learn this fact from Ezekiel so he is our shepherd and he will free us and later on he will come back when he comes back this prophecy will be complete so we're living in the prophecy we're literally seeing what is happening in today's world we're experiencing we're living by it but because people don't read the Bible, because they don't know the covenant, they don't know the promise God made, 
They don't care. No matter what God said, they don't know what God said. People all talking about God's promise, God's promise. What promise? How do you know what promise he made if you don't even know the Bible? What he said, if you don't know, if you don't understand, what's the point? Chapter 35. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against the Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hands against you, and I will make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay your cities waste. And you shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you cherished perpetual enemies and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their, uh, their calamity, at the time of their final punishment, therefore, as I live, declared the Lord God, I will uh, prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue your, uh, pursue you, because you did not hate bloodshed. Therefore, blood shall pursue you. I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolations, and I will cut off from, uh, from it, all who come and go. I will fill its mountain with the slain on your hills and in your valleys and in all your. Ravines, those slain with the sword shall fall. I will make you a perpetual desolation, and your cities shall not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, let's think about for, for a moment what God is talking about the Mount Seir. What is God talking about? Who lives in Mount Seir? Edom. Correct. Edom. Pay attention to what this message is about. Esau, right? And his brother, Jacob. They were brothers, they're siblings. They came from who? Isaac. Remember, Jacob, Esau, they both came from the same father, which is Isaac. They're siblings. So then, Esau and his descendants are destroyed, whereas the Jacob and his descendants will live. What happened here? They came from the same root. They're descendants of Abraham. They're the same sons from Isaac. What happened? Why one is destroyed and why the other one is destroyed? What happened? What's the difference between Esau versus Jacob? What's the difference? Jacob's parents were more God's uh, promise, and his brother didn't care his the firstborn son. Esau didn't care about the firstborn rights. He sold to his brother because he was hungry. Jacob, go after that firstborn ship. Right? He traded. But think about this for a moment. Going back, going back to the story of Esau and Jacob. Wasn't Esau, was a sort of, even though he didn't care about God's promise, but the guy was kind of like the, the macho man and you know, the guy didn't really care about anything else, but he was just 
try to just help himself, right? He was, he was not going after God's promise, but he was going after his own power, right? What about Jacob? What about Jacob? Was he so naive? He was a like, good guy, was he? I don't think so. Jacob was not naive and was a good guy either. He was grieved. He was only care about his blessing, right? And then he wanted to get all the blessings. He cares about his own blessing. He didn't care about Esau. I'm just going to take it away from him, right? Important part is this. They both came from the same root, Isaac. But there is a one chosen, there was an abandon. Esau, as I mentioned, he trusted his own power. He believed in himself. One who trusts himself, your own knowledge, your own wealth, your own understanding, your experience, if you rely on yourself, you will perish. Why? Because those people who believe in themselves, like you have seen the people like, believe in my feast. Your feast what? Those are the people who trust on their own will perish because because they believe the, their own power and their knowledge and wisdom and wealth, they don't need God because they could help themselves. They don't need God. People who claim themselves that I cannot support myself, I can't trust my own power, what do they do? They come to God. Lord, help me. That's the difference. People who trust on their power, own honor, knowledge and wisdom they don't need god isn't that what this world has became about people don't need god anymore because we can help ourselves who can if there's nothing all right that's fine we develop something we innovate something we create something we can help ourselves humans are strong we're intelligent we can do anything we want For those of the people who trust themselves will perish. But because people who come to Jesus because they claim themselves that I am weak, they're the one who will be saved. Jacob was that. He was relying on God's blessing and his promise. Esau didn't care. Even though they came from the same root, once again, God separates sheep from the goats. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. You cannot claim yourself, I came from the same root. My ancestor is Abraham, don't mean anything. So let me ask you this. God made a lot of promises. God made a covenant with the people of Old Testament. All the promise God made with Abraham and his descendants, right? He made a lot of promises. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that what God promised in the Old Testament applies to you and us. All the promise God made, all the covenant God made, is it applies to us? Yes or no? Yes? How? 
God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants. Are you the descendants of Abraham? Are you Israel? Why are you taking promise God made with Abraham and his descendants to your blessings and your covenant? You got nothing to do with Abraham. You're not descendants of Abraham. You're not Jew. What does that covenant have to do with you? Got nothing to do with anyone else but to descendants of Abraham. All the blessing, all the covenants, all, everything what we're reading here applies to Israel, not to us. We're not descendants of Abraham. Then why are you taking these blessings and promises as yours? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's mine. <laughs> I believe it, right? Once again, you can believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> don't mean anything, though. We read together. We just read together. You just don't remember. Go back. <laughs> Galatians again. Read what you read. <laughs> <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as a righteousness, no, then that it is those of a faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that the God would justify the Gentiles by faith preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of a faith are blessed uh, along with Abraham, the man of faith. What does that mean? We're not physically the descendants of Abraham. However, by the faith, we became the descendants of Abraham. That's why the blessings and all the covenant applies to us because we became literally virtually descendants of Abraham by faith, not by blood. So, this is why verse 9 and read 14 again. So, that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is why we inherit the same covenant and blessing that God made with Abraham that applies to us because we became the descendants of Abraham by Faith, not by the blood. Well, now you should be able to answer my question. Even though the, all the promise and covenant and blessing was made by the Abraham and his descendants, we are the descendants of Abraham by faith. If you ask these questions to other your fellow Christians, I tell you, most likely, your fellow won't be able to answer this question. Why? It's very simple. Because we don't understand what we are reading. This is why I kept mentioning reading is not good enough. We have to understand what God is saying to us, not just reading it. Coming back to Ezekiel. So, God is talking about the Mount of Seir, the Edom, even though he came from the same root from Isaac, there will be 
the one who are destroyed, who trust in their own power, versus Jacob, who trusted God's blessings and promise. Now, Jacob is on the right side. Esau is on the left side. Who is a sheep? Jacob. Who is on the goat? Esau. Edomite was destroyed. That's exactly the same thing what God said in the previous chapter. <clears throat> Verse 7. <clears throat> I will make Mount Seir a waste and desolations I will cut off from uh, cut off from it all who come and go and I will fill its mountains with this slain on your hills and in your valleys and all your ravines those of slain with the sword shall fall I will make you perpetual desolations and your cities shall not be inhabited then you will know that I am the Lord so I'm gonna ask you this what do you know about Mount Seir. What is left with the descendants of Edomite? What's left? What do you know about the Edomites? What's left today? What's left today? Nothing. Only thing is left is there, is Petra. Who lives there? Nobody. Was completely destroyed and gone. Because, you said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will take possessions on them, of them. Although the Lord was there, therefore, as I live, declared the Lord God, I will deal with you according to the anger and envy that you showed because of your uh, hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them. When I judge you, you, will, uh, you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all the uh, revealing that you uttered against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid des desolate, they are given us to devour. And you magnified yourself against me with your mouth, and multiplied with, with your words against me. I heard it. So when they actually talked to God about, I don't care about you, God said, I heard you. Though says the Lord God, while the whole earth rejoice, I will make you desolate. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so I will deal with you, you shall be desolate. Mount Seir and all Edom, all of it, then they will know that I am the Lord. Once again, God is clearly mentioning whoever trusts themselves will perish. Whoever trusts the Lord will be saved. So, God actually gave the separate sections in the Bible talking about Edom. What is a separate book that talks about Edom? Do you know? God actually prepared one book for Edom. Which book is that? Does anyone know? Hmm? Does anyone know? Obadiah. Let's go to Obadiah. There is a there is a book called Obadiah in the Bible. <laughs> Verse 
The vision of Obadiah. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard the report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us arise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations, you shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the cliff of rock, in your lofty dwelling, who says in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground, though you soar aloft like an eagle? Though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down. Edom trusted his own power. And then he placed the nest on the top of the mountain and saying, My place is a safe. No one can reach me. And I can protect myself. I can guard myself. I don't need God. Even if you put your nest on the top of the mountain, I will bring you down. Even if you place your nest in the stars, I will bring you down. Once again, you can trust what you own. You can trust what you have. You can trust whatever you want. It's your choice. It's your freedom. God gave every one of us the free will to do whatever we want. Making a right choice. Making a right decision. At the end, it will determine where we will end up. We, I always been saying this. We can make any decision. The consequence we will have to face. Whether we like it or not, we will face the consequence of our own decision. God is just saying, make the right decision. Make the right choice. So, God set aside one book in the Old Testament talking about the fall of Edom. Edom. Have you ever heard of it? Any preachings that are coming from Obadiah? <laughs> I don't remember any <laughs> preachings that are coming from Obadiah. I, I have not heard. I have not heard of any <laughs> pastors who preach about Obadiah. That's why nobody knows Obadiah. So I always say, if you don't, if you don't read this ever, <laughs> it's like, why don't you rip it off? <laughs> like just, just rip it off. <laughs> Light up the Bible. Only take up the Bible sections that you read. Once again. When we trust ourselves, we will literally be destroyed. So, let's take a look at um, let's see. Uh, no, let's, let's just continue on. <clears throat> Let's move on to chapter 36. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountain of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord God, because the enemy said to you, Aha! And the ancient heights have become our possessions. Therefore, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides, so that you became the possessions of the rest of the nations, and you became, you became the talk and evil gossip of the people. 
Therefore, O mountain, uh, mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God, so says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys and desolates and wastes and uh, des uh, deserted cities, which have become a prey and uh, derisions to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, though, says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my heart jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who gave my Lord and uh, my land to themselves as a possessions with wholehearted joy and utter contempt, that they might make it uh, pasture land a, pr a prey. Therefore, Prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountain and hills and the ravines and valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am spoken in my jealous wrath, because you have suffered and reproached of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear that I, uh, I, I swear that the nations that are all around you shall them uh, shall themselves suffer. Reproach, but you, O mountain of Israel, shall shoot forth and your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sawn, and I will multiply the people on you. The whole house of Israel, all of it, the cities shall be inhabited and the waste place rebuilt, and I will multiply it on your man and beast, and they shall multiply to be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited as in your formal times, and do some good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you. Even my people Israel, and they shall possess you, and you shall be their inheritance, and you shall no longer breathe then a them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, You devour people, and you breathe your nations of children's. Therefore, you shall no longer devour people, and no longer breathe your nations of children. Declares the Lord God, and I will not let hear any more the reproach of the nations, and you shall no longer bear the disgrace of the people, and no longer cause your nations to stumble, declare the Lord God. So what is God talking about? God is already talking about the blessings and restorations of Israel. When is he talking? He's talking about this when he's about to punish and then destroy the Judah. Who will trust this? <laughs> when you talk about blessings, when you're about to destroy it, who will trust that? But God is already talking about blessing and restorations while they were destroyed. Now, will God restore us? Absolutely. All believers and Christians will suffer it. We'll go through the persecutions, as God said. But what happened at the end? We know the end. He will restore us. He will bring us to the resting place. That's the promise. Why is he doing what he's doing? Verse 16 and on. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. Once again, what is Israel is referenced as? Woman going through the menstrual. Remember, according to the Moses law. What happens to the, the women who go through this menstru uh, menstruations? Unclean. Unclean. Remember, woman is always referenced as either in Israel, 
in the New Testament as a church. I mentioned several times, more than several times. <laughs> so, Israel is now going through the menstruation period. You're unclean, but I will make you clean. I will make you clean. Verse 18, so I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land for the idols which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their ways and their deeds. I judged them. But when they came to the nations, where, wherever they came, they profaned my holy names in that people said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the uh, house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Which means, I am purifying you. I'm purifying you. I will make you clean. How do we refine the gold? Go to the fire. Correct. To refine the gold and silvers, it has to put into the fire first to purify it. Once I purify you, then the next step, verse 22 and on, therefore, Say to the house of Israel, though says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. So what God is saying is, not because you're doing anything good. It's not because you're, you're, you deserve, but for the sake of my name, I will do this. Do what? And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declared the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. So all you did, defile my name. You did all bad things by worshiping. You profane me. You have not done anything good. Your deeds, your act, everything, you not deserve to be cleansed. But for the sake of my name, I will cleanse you. Just like you're going through the menstruations, you're uncleaned, but I will clean you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stones from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rule. Hey, this is the word that we know for sure. This is the message that you know. Out of all this what you don't know is what God said in the previous <laughs> or after nobody cares about what God said before or after they just know this particular verse but they don't know what he said it before after who cares this is important is that how you read the Bible that's not how you read the Bible you need to understand what God said, why he said this. Everything what we saw in the book of Ezekiel up to this point, God said so many things to come to this point. 
But we don't care what he said in the previous. Who cares about what he feels? Who cares about what he did? What he's... If you don't care, this means nothing to you. Up to this point, how was the God felt about Israel? He's pouring out his heart, his pain, his heartache. He was pouring out and letting people know what you did and how you hurt me. This is what you did. So I will punish you. But after he said, but I will restore you. It's like you just disciplined your sons, your daughters. But are telling your sons and daughters, I don't hate you. I'm not just hitting you because I hate you, because I love you. I want you to live well. I want you to live better than me. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing to you. Because I care, because I love you. Isn't that, isn't that par the heart of the parents? You defile my name. Your deed, I should destroy, just like any other countries, like Edom. But because I love you, I will restore you. What I will do, once again, let's read one more time from verse 25 and on. I will sprinkle clean, clean water on you, and you shall be clean from your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart new spirit what is that new spirit that is the Holy Spirit I will put within you not on you within you it's coming into us this is the promise that God made, right? When did we receive this? When we, when the disciples gather, when they were praying, they received the promise, the Holy Spirit, for the first time in them. That's the promise. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. So what is our heart? It's like a stone, so hardened. It's like a, it's like so stiff, not soft. Your flesh, and I give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statue and careful to obey my rule. What does that mean? When the Holy Spirit comes to you, then what happened? Then you walk in my statue and be careful to obey my rule. When the Holy Spirit is in you, then now you can obey. Before, you wouldn't. You shall dwell in the land that I give I give you, I gave you to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So, until that point, I'm not your God. I will truly be your God when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. And I will summon the grain and make its abundant and lay no famines on, upon you. I will make the fruit of the trees and increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of a famine among the nations. John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branch. When the Holy Spirit is in us, we will bear the fruit abundantly. Then you will remember your evil ways. And your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourself for your iniquities and your abominations. 
It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. I let, uh, let, let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. What is God saying? It's not because you're clean, not because you're righteous, not because of your deed. Because for the sake of my name, I will cleanse you. Though says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste place that shall be rebuilt. Then the land that was desolate shall be tilted instead of being the desolations that it was in the sight of all who passed by. Who then will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolations and ruined the cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around, you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is the commitment God made. I will do it. This will happen. Did this happen? Yes, absolutely it did happen. Though says the Lord God, this also I will left the house of Israel ask me to do for them to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so shall the waste city be filled with flock of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. How many times he's been saying this? A lot. <laughs> a lot, right? You can't even count how many times he's been saying this. So therefore, now, you understand why Ezekiel is so important for us to understand. It's not just Ezekiel, of course. We need to understand every book of the Bible. Because it, God made a lot of promises. And what, the, what is this promise God giving us? Is he saying he's going to make us rich? Is he saying he's going to just make us just to live well? Is that the promise God made? No. God is talking about our salvation and purification. That's what God is talking about. And I, will, I hope you get this message and understand God's heart. All right, we're going to cover up to chapter 36, and then we'll continue on from chapter 37 next week. Any questions?